Morning guys and girls, hope you're all doing well. And as you can probably see, I'm not in my workshop for this one. And there's a good reason for that. It's gonna be another story time with Neil, I guess we're gonna go for, but it's basically just a thank you video guys, cause we've reached a thousand subscribers and that's a massive milestone for me. Um, so thank you so, so much to all the subscribers, all the people that have sort of followed watching. It's crazy, I actually get people call me at the shop and congratulate me on some of the videos and they really like it. And it's nice, it's like a, a little community. And first of all, I know I'm so bad at the whole comment thing. Now that it's a thousand subscribers, I guess I have to take the whole thing a little bit more serious. So I will be replying more um, and hopefully being a bit more interactive with you guys. I still don't want to go down the route of saying like, oh, which wire do I connect what to to get this to happen? That's that's not really what YouTube comments for. But it's generally for everyone to have a chat about stuff, especially around the whole car culture subject thing. So yeah, I've got a bit of a special one for you guys today. So I'm going to tell you about a story. We're going to go back. Oh, let's go back just over 10 years, I'd say. Um, and it's definitely the most expensive car I've ever worked on. Definitely the rarest car um, and a really strange, challenging job. Yet again, I couldn't have do it without my old mate, Andy. Um, absolute legend. He'll definitely get a shout out during this whole video thing. So yet again, thank you so much, guys. Thousand subscribers, it means I can get this YouTube money in. Um, and to be honest, with my stats, I'm gonna get in pennies, but it's not about the money, it's about the appreciation. And I appreciate all you guys that have spent your time to watch my videos. I think I've only got 35 videos or something, so I guess that's good to get a thousand subscribers. Probably just over two years I've been doing this now. And it's been great fun, to be honest. It's a, it's a bit of a pain. You can see this is my little workstation, my very old laptop that I use to do all the editing. Um, a little bit about here. We've got 3D printer that I use for some stuff. But this is where the magic happens. And as you can see, my passions are things like RC cars. You'll probably spot there's some hockey stuff around, bikes, all sorts of bits and pieces, Lego over there and stuff. Um, I'm definitely a big kid at heart. I'm nearly 40 and I guess I shouldn't be having Lego, but say la vie, let anyone can enjoy Lego. So let me go back. And if any of you have seen the Spiker video that I did, I think this is what caused this to happen. You can imagine the company that I'm about to mention, they're not the sort of company that you can just call up and say, hey, can I do some work for you? It doesn't work like with any of these guys. And even when I was working for them, there was still a lot of aggro and issues. But I guess word of mouth got thrown about about this spiker job that I did, because um, it wasn't too long. It's probably only about six weeks, two months later that I received a phone call at the shop. And that led on to one of the most, I'd say, most exciting jobs I've ever done. Very challenging, some real silly, silly rules they set for me. Um, and a lot of weird stuff regards to not being able to film, show, do anything. Obviously, I wasn't filming YouTube back then anyway. But just taking pictures, they wanted to take my phone off me before I entered the building. And all these sort of weird things happening. So let's go back to the day when I was sitting in the shop, working hard as always. And uh, you'll see what happened. Creative car sounds, Neil speaking, I'm help you. Hi Graham. MSO. Um, the only MSO I can think of would be McLaren Special Operations. <laughs> yeah, I have heard of you guys. You guys are amazing. Um, yeah, so how can I help you? So you can probably guess, like at first I was kind of like, is this a real conversation? Is someone just winding me up? McLaren? back then are very prestigious. They're, they're not sort of a muckabout company. I think they just released the MP12 4C. Um, and for McLaren, that was a little bit different because prior to that, they'd done a few, what did they have? They had the F1, for instance. I heard hype about this new thing called the P1, which was very, very exciting to hear. And there was some other stuff, things like the, the McLaren SLR, for instance. But like I say, if you was to put MSO into Google, you'll come through to a page that looks something like this. And, and, these guys are legit. Like I'm a small car audio installer in North London. These guys are sort of like the international company. So McLaren Special Operations are where you'd go or where you'd ask. So you've bought a McLaren or you've bought something and you wanna make some changes to it. It's sort of like a, a bespoke service offered by McLaren. It's pretty much in the title, McLaren Special Operations. They do things on the sly that are sort of different. It's not the sort of place you can just walk into and buy a car. You have to be on the owner's books. You have to be sort of known by the company. Um, and you can probably see by the stuff on here on the screen, they, they do some beautiful stuff. Um, and I had heard of them because obviously McLaren, I was a big fanboy back in the day, things like Jaguar XJ2, 
220, um, things like the McLaren F1. These are sort of like the poster boy supercar stuff. And I'd always sort of wondered like, oh, I wonder if I could ever get a job working with these guys, for these guys sort of thing. Not because it was just McLaren, not that they're my favorite, but that's sort of like a really high bar set. So anyway, I, I sort of, I went through the route of like, oh, well, hi, Graham, sort of nice to chat to you. And he was very, very shady on the phone about what he wanted. He said, look, I'll send you some emails um, and we'll start sort of talking. But the basic gist is he wanted me to head down to Woking and go to the McLaren Special Operations and have a discussion with them. And he wouldn't tell me anything about the car. He wouldn't tell me anything about the job. It was I didn't know whether I'd be setting up a system for someone like doing the dsps or whether i had to do a full system i presumed it was car audio because obviously that's what my name had been thrown around with spiker and all those sort of things it, it had to be something to do with av or audio or something in a car that someone obviously wanted but i would have never guessed the job that it led to um, and he gave me a very very small little detail and to be honest i'm probably going to get in trouble for this youtube video because at the time i had to sign an nda um, which is like a non-disclosure agreement, because McLaren are very sensitive, should we say, about what happens within their body of work, who gets to work on cars and things like that. Um, and he dropped a very, very small hint, and he said VIN 61. Now, at the time, I didn't know what VIN 61 was. I knew what a VIN number was, because obviously that's the vehicle identification number. But VIN 61 sounded very unique, let's say that. So after the conversation, it took a few days for the emails and everything to come through. And during the time I was Googling, um, and you can trust Google, I guess, when it comes to this sort of thing. And there was one car that kept popping up under VIN 61. And it was also a very famous car at the time because it had been involved in a bit of a horrific accident. And there was the, the opportunity to rebuild the car. We probably know who the owner was. It was Rowan Atkinson and he had his McLaren F1 and it kind of fell to bits and they did rebuild the car for him. I don't know what the value of that was. It's probably sort of into the millions to rebuild it. I guess they thought at the time when they were rebuilding it, is there anything Rowan wanted to change or add or have different? And I guess... Actually, I don't know why McLaren themselves, maybe they don't have specialists in this sort of avenue, or maybe it's just easier for them to farm it out to another company um, and get them to deal with it. So uh, if you also do a search for VIN 61, as you can see, that's what you get up there. Ryan Atkinson's, it was sort of a lovely burgundy color. It was a really, really nice car. or well, it is a really, really nice car. I don't believe he still owns it now. Um, let's see, like early 97, it was originally built. I think it was, yeah, the 49th sort of one of the lot. And you can see it's got a really weird arrangement with the seating where you get a front seat and then you get two passenger seats either side of you. So it's a three seater and your steering wheel is actually banging in the middle of the car. So very much like a, a Formula One car sitting in the middle. Um, I don't think that's why they called it F1 because it's not an F1 car, but it comes from the same sort of heritage, I guess. Same sort of carbon fiber, very, very good engine, very, very good drivability um, and a crazy, crazy quick car for back then. What I'm going to do is we're going to jump over there and I'm going to show you all the little pictures I've got for it, um, what bits I could get and what bits I couldn't get. Um, and I'll talk you through the whole process. So sit back, get a cup of tea or coffee, whatever you want to do. And um, let me explain to you about the time that I was invited by McLaren to go and work on VIN 61. Oh, and just as a side note, it was resold for £12 million. Pounds. Um, yeah. That's a lot of dough. Right then. So we put into the sat nav the location they gave us and we head down obviously towards Woking and we drive straight past the big McLaren sign that you can see there, which leads off to the main McLaren building. So it's like, okay, well, obviously, yeah, I didn't know where MSO were, to be honest. I don't think they really advertise much where their location is and things. So anyway, so we carry on driving down the road and we end up at this strange sort of red brick building. And as you can see, you've got me van there and a couple of nice McLarens just sitting out the front there. Um, I'd never actually been up close to one of these before, so we had a little snoop around them. And, and yeah, really nice cars back in those sort of days, what, 10 years ago. Yeah, looking the part, um, especially like the black one, the wheels on it were really cool. So yeah, really nice bit of kit. Um, but it didn't feel like we was at McLaren, essentially. It just felt like uh, the back of like a big warehouse sort of industrial park, but it was fully gated entry. You couldn't just drive in here unless you were sort of allowed in. We had to be buzzed through from the office essentially. And we go into the building and obviously straight away, they're already being a little bit sort of um, 
a little bit coy with us with regards to who we are, making sure we've got name tags. We go into the first room and the first thing is they start talking about NDAs and everything else. And I'm thinking, hang on a sec, like we, we've not even discussed jobs, work, anything like that. I, I could refuse to do it or it may be beyond my capabilities or anything else. So really odd. And I'll explain why as we go through this whole sort of um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. We go upstairs and we're sitting in a little waiting room. And there's a glass ceiling, or oh, sorry, not a glass ceiling, a glass floor. Um, and you look down and there's a very nice McLaren SLR. Now, I can't remember exactly what the gentleman said who I was introduced to first. He did mention about Lewis Hamilton and something about this is the, the standard that SLRs have to be produced to. Now, I don't know if this is sort of a, a special car. I doubt I'll ever find out, to be honest. But there was definitely something about that the other McLarens almost get graded against this one. So I presume this is sort of like their their elite version and then everything has to meet the spec of this one. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember exactly what he said. Uh, Lewis Hamilton's name were thrown out there. Now, whether that's a thing or not, whether the guy was just trying to impress me, I'm not sure. Um, and then as we panned up and looked left, you could see there's a lovely sort of really clean clinical workshop, much cleaner than the stuff I've been before. You can see white walls, white floors. Um, and as you're looking down there, you've got an orange and blue one down there, and they're just the new McLaren MP4s. And then you can see, as those doors are slightly different, um, there's another type of car there, and it's an F1. And I've never been up close to an F1 before. They're, they're way beyond what I can afford, to be all honest. And it looked awesome. And there's a whole rumour, me and Andy started talking, because I remember hearing a long time ago that they had gold exhausts. And to me, that makes no sense, because gold's very soft. And it wouldn't really work as regards to metal for exhaust, but it's very, very good at heat reflection and every sort of its its thermal properties are great regards to keeping things cool when you need them to. Are you like a reflective surface? And I've zoomed in a little bit and you can see here. And the gold part is actually on the lid of it. So to stop the heat coming through, boiling the paint. Obviously, these are V12s and they get incredibly hot as far as I know, like any sort of V12 engine. Um, there's a lot of cylinders, a lot of combustion, a lot of a lot of stuff happening in that very small space. So the, the heat of it is crazy. And so that was sort of the first glimpse of something that we could be working on. But yet again, we're not told anything about the job or anything of that, apart from the fact that we're in this really sort of prestigious looking office space essentially and I'll go back a little bit actually I'll go back to the previous one now I don't know if you can see over here I won't zoom in because I probably would get in trouble for this deal this was the whole reason why there was an NDA um because I did question them of sort of like why why the secrecy obviously you've asked me and Andy to come down here obviously you've invited us into the building and you kind of seemed like you're worried about some sort of espionage or something of that sort of nature. And later on during the video, the gentleman actually took me around the other side of that wall that you can see. And there was a car there that had an electric motor halfway down. And I'm sort of like, well, since when has there been a car with an engine and electric motor from McLaren? Now, there wasn't any body show on this. It was the, the sort of the chassis of the vehicle. And looking at it now, I knew exactly what it is. It was the P1. And obviously, I don't know if it had just been released or if it was being released or it wasn't something that you could get any information on. They were very secretive. And obviously, me and Andy, a couple of lads walking in and taking snaps of their brand new flagship motor. I'm sure they'd have a bit of a problem with that in regards to maybe if Lamborghini or Ferrari or another one of those sort of companies wanted a few images they probably would have paid me really handsomely to find out what's happening underneath the skin of a P1. And I think that's the main reason for the whole sort of secrecy and the whole event of the jobs and everything else. Everything that we went through with this, it was it was almost like sort of, oh, don't do anything, don't look anywhere, just do what you're here for. And it was a, a bit of a strange one. I felt a bit sort of, a bit put off by it. The fact that they, they trusted me enough to bring me into the building but they didn't want me to film and take photos. And obviously this is a big deal for me. This isn't like you're going down to your just general car dealership. This is MSO, this is where the magic happens. So I, I get it now, looking back, I can see why they wanted NDAs and everything else. Now the NDA was also exclusively about the car that we was working on. Um, and I kind of get that too, because like I say, they're very protective of their, their intellectual property, I guess. And they don't want just a couple of lads coming by and sort of giving all the secrets away. But we'll jump back in. So as you can see, the gold exhaust piece. 
And then the gentleman brought me some stuff and I was like, well, we've not seen a car yet, essentially. Um, and he started showing me these sort of parts and bits and pieces. Um, basically, I think just to get familiar with it. And it was a bit of an odd one. As you can see there, that's that's one of the F1 amplifiers that they used. Different sort of inputs and outputs and all the normal sort of stuff. And I was thinking, okay, right, well, it's to do with car audio, essentially. But we never actually saw on this trip what we were going to be doing in regards to the car we was working on or any of the sort of information. They gave us sort of like snip bits. And then they brought us to sort of this panel piece. Um, we actually had a look in that black F1. They showed us this section here. Now what this is, this is controlling the Kenwood audio system that's in the car. And the system was really kind of simple. It was made up of a 12 disc CD changer at the front. And that was pretty much all you got. And there was a tiny, tiny little display that comes up on the sort of the, what we call the cluster. Um, and that would show you what track you're on. Like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's interesting. And it was sort of like, right, well, can we get to the sort of the stage where we we know roughly what we're doing? Because I was still oblivious to what, we were being asked to do yet but they were showing all these nice things and bits and pieces and then obviously that's the, the cd changer that sits at the front and it's good like it was a, a nice sort of thing to see these products that i'd heard about but never actually sort of had any dealing with in a way you, you couldn't go into kenwood or any car audio shop and buy this sort of stuff this was specifically between kenwood and mclaren now for the old school audio nerds, they would have heard of something called the Kenwood Dual Mags. Back in the day, Kenwood used to make really, really good car audio stuff. They were sort of top tier. Unfortunately, they fell off the pace a bit. Kenwood themselves as a whole company went under, but they were top of their game for this. And they did things like develop a specific CD changer just for the F1. And I believe I'm correct in saying they were the first company that had used rare earth magnets on the back of their speakers. Please keep the weight down. Now, obviously, the doors you'll, you'll see on an F1, they go up. And obviously, everything is about lightweight performance, everything else. And you'd be amazed at how heavy speakers change things, like when you've got the doors coming up and down. There's certain sort of, the, the weight has to be balanced so that the door freely moves and everything else. And they did a really nice job with what they had produced. So yeah, that's where the origin of the dual mags. Um, and a lot of companies followed suit. Like the rare earth magnets are very, very strong, very, very compact and very, very powerful. They're lightweight and they, they give you everything you need. So if you ever get a set of these, they are, I think they may still be in production. I've seen some dual mags, not maybe today, but re-releases and other things. And there's certainly other companies that use them nowadays. But I think these were the original guys that were starting to use this sort of technology just purely on a weight saving basis. So anyway, so we had a nice chat with them and they gave us a box full of stuff. And you can see this is actually back at my workshop and it's kind of fitting that the picture that I've got up there, sorry it's out of focus, these are the best pictures I have to be honest of it. There's a nice Kenwood poster and we now have the Kenwood F1 gear down the bottom. And this little box down here, you can see, that's obviously the outer casing for this section. And this was their black box. Now this was sort of like the, the control brains behind it all. I believe, weirdly, it ran a Grundig FM radio that was situated underneath the right-hand passenger seat. Um, and then you had that control interface. And it was basically like a switch box between whether you're listening to the CD player or whether you're listening to the radio. We come back to the shop and then they gave me a phone call and they explained roughly what they want to happen. They said, sort of like, familiarise yourself with the parts that we've given you, see how it's been put together, because Rowan wants to add a couple of features to the car. Now, one thing that he was missing was any sort of Bluetooth streaming facility, which was, was newish back then. It wasn't a sort of a, a popular thing, um, but he wanted the ability to stream music and DAB radio was coming. And FM radio is okay, but DAB radio is much better. So we're sort of sitting down and looking through the system. And basically the job entailed us finding a way of being able to add DAB and Bluetooth to this system. And it's like, well, I understand now looking at it, thinking about the R&D that would have gone into this to make this happen. You couldn't really go back to Kenwood because this was from like 1990s and getting them to redo it and build it in the manner that formed digital solutions. This is all analog. This is, there was no digital part of this system. It was all very much basic relays, analog signals, everything else. Um, Bluetooth streaming and DAB radio, 
they're they're sort of more digital platforms so it's like all right okay let's let's see how this sort of goes and we, we had a little play around and sort of powered up the unit and i think the next shot is us they gave us all the schematics i, I have got a load of information which sort of like how the schematics work and how we could get the system to fire up external from the car um, and as you can see it's proper like old school putting wires into pins and drop solder tabs to make things work um, and it was fun because it was sort of like the old old way of doing things using relays and switches and things um, but as you can see it's quite a complex circuit board considering all it did was switch a couple of sources around and it was sort of like well there has to be a good way of doing this now there's some funny games that I'll, I'll talk about in a second that was the real sort of like what but we'll we'll get there so as we go through, I've mentioned Andy quite a few times in this video, and here is the legend himself. Not sure why this photo relates to anything. This looks like the back of a pickup truck. It was just a picture that I had at the same sort of time. Um, but yeah, mastermind when it comes to sort of doing this AV control. And obviously, yeah, I was sort of like not an apprentice to him. I was actually his boss, but he was by far superior at doing sort of like the old school tech. I think I'm, I was a bit younger, obviously, and a bit more into the newer stuff. And he was very much the old school fabricate, the old school circuit builder, sort of the old ways things. And to be honest, this job wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Andy doing his magic, to be fair. So going on and we started stripping down the cables and it, and it seemed like a fairly simple sort of thing. It was a case of, well, we know we can get sound into the amplifier because there's a few spare inputs and there's a few spare ports. So that won't be a problem because obviously we couldn't change what was in there. All of the original stuff had to stay in position, barring the Grundig part. That was the only bit that we was allowed to change because that wasn't part of the, the Kenwood package, essentially. Um, the changer still had to work. The amplifier still had to be the thing that drives the speakers. As far as the, the system runs, it runs the exact same way. Um, so we go about stripping about all the bits and pieces and, and they were kind of gracious. They must have had a few spares of these items because they just sent us out with these bits. So we did the sort of the hard work with, as you can see, it is literally a case of working out which pin goes where, how that communicates. Can we use that signal to run through? Um, and there's a good few weeks of going through the processes and sort of working out what would be the best way to do this. Now, at the time, we didn't know or I didn't know whether we were going to be doing the job or not. This was sort of like a, a concept sort of thing. Can it be done? in a way that appeases McLaren in regards to everything stays the same, but Rowan gets what he wants regards to the added extras that he'd require. Um, and you can see roughly, so once we'd worked out what was gonna go on, you can see the original stuff there is all the black at the bottom. And then the new bit was the part that we added through. So we, we could obviously adapt the original antenna because we couldn't put a DAB antenna into the car. So we found obviously a, a device that would then convert the FM to a DAB signal. Um, that would then run over to the sort of the switch box. So we knew we had to have our own way of intercepting the signal. It was a bit of a strange one because that little control box that you saw with the buttons on it that controls when the bass and the treble and everything else, everything seemed to run back up to that and back down to their little magic black box. And then the hard work was done from that point onwards. So we're going through and it was like, right, OK, we've got an extra input. We can use these pins. And along the process of doing this, they needed to see all these pictures and all these sort of concepts. And and to be honest, yeah, it isn't going to be the neatest work because it was just a, a proof of concept to make sure that it could happen. Whether they wanted us to do the R&D and then they would actually remanufacture the parts required. Um, all that was sort of still an unknown. But this is McLaren MSO. If they say jump, I'm going to say how high just for the privilege of being able to say that I've done this work, for instance. So we gave them a nice easy solution. We said, right, once we've got to this sort of level, whatever we send into those RCAs will react on your system as long as we give it sort of a, a switch command, something to make it jump to this input rather than the other inputs, exactly like they had theirs where the input was coming from the FM or it was coming from the CD changer. We basically like added another version of that. Um, and then it gets to this bit, the what the fudge. Um, so I was talking to him about where can we put our stereo or where can we put our wireless controller or where can we put our screen so that Rowan knows what he's doing um, and they were like well you can't add a screen that's a hundred percent we don't really want any extra controllers the car has to look the exact same as everything else 
um, will give you one button. And I think this is the bit where their engineers probably got a little bit stuck by it. It's like, how can you make this work by just adding one button to control multiple sources plus things like volume, skip track, um, all of the sort of the stuff of that sort of nature. How would you interact with the system? And then it was the penny drop moment. It's like, wow, okay, I'm gonna have to work out a solution where we have to use their controller, maybe adding a button onto it, but we can't change how it visually looks compared to other McLarens to make our system work. And this was the head scratch. This was the sort of the, right, well, we've got to figure this. We've gone so far into this. There was a point at which I thought, you know what? Is it worth the time and effort involved? Ignore the money, ignore sort of what the, the charges would be. Is it worth the head scratch to be so limited on what we can do to be able to give him what he wants? So we go back to that controller now. As you can see, there's not even a space on there that would be nice. It's, there was no space of it. Like this bit's taken up, for instance, with the window control. This is all sort of arranged through and it was a case of, well, we can't even fit a button on there. And then we look at that little light area in the bottom left. And that little light area was basically to show whether it was on or off the system, i.e. what mode you was in. You was either in the CD changer mode or you was in the FM mode. And we're like, well, maybe we could turn that window into a button that then makes these controls work with our system, depending on how many times or what color you click that button for. And that got the brain sort of running with it. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? This, this can be done. It's not gonna be that pretty. It's not gonna be that sophisticated, but it will work and it will meet their criteria. Um, so we start, taking apart that control panel. They did send us one to swap. I think they send us two in the end, just one to strip apart to basically take it to bits and another one to use as a reference so we know what the original signals were doing in and out. Um, so it was yet again, Andy with his infinite knowledge of going through and sort of how we can access things. Um, and so we broke it all down to the point where this was happening. So this was sort of like the stage in between the button press and then the plug that led off to their little black box. I was like, okay, well, we've got tracks on there. Now, one thing you can do with tracks is you can change the tracks. We did suggest to them, can we reproduce this circuit board? No, you can't reproduce the circuit board because that wouldn't be the McLaren original part. It's like, right, can we modify this panel to make it do what we want to do? And after a bit of two and a throw in, we explained to them what we wanted to do. And I said, look, it, it's kind of that or nothing. So allow us to do this and we'll see whether the concept will work. It was then a case of sit back down, go through all of the cables, all the connectors, and you can probably see just there, there's some relays and they're multipole relays, which means we can run multiple signals into them and have them all switch simultaneously. Um, if my memory serves me right, this was a, a 12 pole three position. So it means we could influence 12 wires at the exact same time that meant we could switch between sort of what would be like our system and their system. And going forwards, it was a case of, right, well, that little window, maybe if we got it to stand proud and then we attached the button eventually, essentially underneath that onto another circuit board so that it still illuminates in the same manner, you still get their system running but you can press that little glass piece or acrylic piece, we say, not glass, and then that would give you the different options. So we then had to send them prototypes roughly. And as you can see, it's not pretty stuff. Like we've scratched back the track there and then actually soldered on to keep the original LED working so that it can go your reds and your greens. And we needed another source. We needed something like a blue, for instance. Now that was sort of the, the start of it sort of coming together in a way, we thought, right, we've got a, a proof of concept now. Now we have to make it work. It's easy to say you can do it. It's tough to actually put it all together. So you can see on this circuit board, we would intercept this track. So make a break in that track and solder join and solder join. Now, if we ran this circuit through that relay and the relay was say relaxed, 
their original signal would come out of this green and head back up this green and would, it would make its back to the same connection point so the system would remain the same. Same on the yellow, so you'll see they're all pairs. We've got a yellow one and a yellow one there, and the red one and the red one there. And that was basically just to interact with these large masks, which were those switches that you saw, the, the big rotary control knobs on there. Um, and it got a little bit messier as we added more and more things to it, but they didn't seem to mind this. And I think they sort of appreciated that what they were asking was kind of tough, and that's potentially why they hadn't done it. And we had to sort of go back to real Bobby basic stuff, like scratching tracks and soldering onto connection points. You may laugh, like this is a very, very expensive car, but McLaren are asking me to continue with this process in the knowledge that it's sort of gonna be a proof of concept and then they're gonna remanufacture something or change something um, to make the, the real working part. So we're getting down and we thought, right, we need our own little control box. And as you can see, those are those threes and then by 12 sort of points running across. Um, it may have not been 12 thinking about it. I, I would have to check the schematics, but I don't have to give all my secrets away. And um, the main thing is the concept worked. We then needed some other things. So basically the, all those switches that we had, how are we going to get those to control, say, a new stereo that has DAB and Bluetooth? Now, one thing you can do, especially with American cars, is they use resistive steering wheel control. So you can teach a little box, a module basically, when it receives a certain ohm resistance, we can tell it that we want that to be a play and pause, or we want that to be a skip track, skip up, skip down, whatever we want. So if we took the circuits that they had, once we've run it into our relay, onto our wiring, we could then put that through different resistors, like known valued resistors, that would then feed back in. As you can see, it's getting messier, but this is all covered up, so I don't mind. And to be honest, you should have seen some of their work in all honesty. I'm, I'm surprised at McLaren, but it's, I guess it was an afterthought about our audio. Um, so there's a little box in here, a little American product, that was basically gonna translate what buttons we pressed into something that we could say run a Pioneer or a Kenwood or an Alpine stereo that would then give us the controls from the original McLaren control module to be able to interact with our system. Um, and I think in a minute, let me just jump forwards. Yeah, so that's essentially the CD player that we had. Um, and we had it all laid out on the desk and I'm just gonna cut away from this little PowerPoint presentation and show you a little video of how this works. So in the meantime, we have never seen the car that we're gonna work on. This is us back at our shop, working with these parts, basically building test rigs. And they were really, really impressed by this. And I was sort of like, this looks like dog's dinner technology, but the concept works. And therefore if the concept works, they seem to be happy. So. Right, so many, many, many months later, or not too many actually, a few months later after the original visit to MSO, um, we had the system working as far as they'd seen. They'd seen the video that you just seen. Um, and obviously there was a lot of still neatening up. We, we could dress it up as nice as we could. We could cloth wrap everything, make it all set. But we needed to sort of get onto the vehicle now to make sure that we know how long the cable runs are and everything else. So back up to MSO. Um, and I kind of presumed it would have just been a proof of concept. But when we get there, actually this is just another little picture, another little SLR. Um, when we get there and we're now in the same room, but there are McLaren F1s everywhere. Um, and I sneakily took my phone, which I said to them I didn't have turned on. 
um, and sneakily took a few pictures. So how many people get to be in a room with multiple F1s? And obviously all the number plates were off. We, we couldn't tell where these were from. Some had spoilers, some had different lights, some had different wheels. It was the, the MSO part of it. You, you buy this value of car and you want it to have fluffy Dyson purple seats. That's exactly what they'll do. So we get to work actually on Rowan's car and, and this is Rowan's car right next to us here. Um, obviously at the time we, we didn't meet Rowan there or anything like that. It was a case that this was working at the garage there. But you can see the level of cleanliness in there. It was, it was very, very cool. Even to the point that they used Henry Hoovers so that they could empty the Hoover into a metal detector later in the day just to make sure that nothing had been dropped that should have been on the car in case a nut and bolt got swept up. It was it was really cool to see, to be honest, how this sort of level of company treat their cars um, way, way, way above anything else I'd ever seen before. All the engineers were in suit and ties. They weren't your mechanics sort of thing. They, they were engineers. Um, so we get into Rowan's car and essentially we try our test panel. So we can drop it in, as you can see, they'd managed to get a little symbol on here to show you the radio and CD. Now, apparently there wasn't enough room to put the extra bit in, but they needed the light there to be able to show. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, I think this was just on his one exclusively because not all of them came with radio. I think most of them just had CD. And that was sort of what most people had in their McLarens. And this was sort of like an extra. So obviously he wanted radio. Um, so it was nice to sort of actually get to the point of working on this car. Now, as you can see, that's now in and we've got this blue light here, which is what you would have seen in that video a second ago of us switching that. So when we hit that switch, it would then activate the Bluetooth or the DAB, depending. Now, granted, it was a pain to use because you couldn't have a screen. So you couldn't really tell unless you looked over your right shoulder and had looked down at the stereo to see what it was on. But at the end of the day, the proof of concept worked all the volume controls, everything else, the bass, the treble, everything else was functional. Um, and it was one button. So I was feeling rather proud of myself and Andy for the fact that we'd managed to achieve this. And as you can see going through the pictures, we've got the blue, we've got the green, which obviously meant their CDs worked. And then we've got the red, which was their original radio. And I think they were over the moon, to be honest, because they were really happy. So it seemed like we'd fulfilled the task. So really really happy with that side of it so this is uh, rowan atkinson's car and to the left of it you can see the orange one i don't know if you can just make out on top of the front wheel arches here there's the vents now this is a mclaren f1 lm the le mans edition really beautiful like race spec interior exposed carbon all over the place that's apparently a very very valuable car considering this one sold for 12 million I'd hate to think the cost of that one. Um, but it was just so nice to be around these sort of cars and to be trusted to walk around their workshop. Um, although, like I say, they'd probably hate to know that I'm even doing this video and showing these things. And it wouldn't surprise me at all at some point in this life, I get a phone call and email if Graham is still there and he's like, Neil, what the hell? Why did you do this? But we're talking about 10 years ago. Rowan doesn't own the car anymore. I don't even know if the system is still in the car. Maybe someone had enough of it. Maybe they've taken it out. Maybe they've changed it in a different manner. I do not know. But there's one thing you have to get when you work on these cars, and that is a selfie. Sitting in the center seat, which was an absolute horrible car to get into because you had to sort of slide your bum onto the side panel of the passenger seat to the left or the right of you, and then sort of squeeze yourself into the center to sit down. Uncomfortable, but McLaren F1. And I don't know many people can say they've sat in one. So yeah, that's my big up. And you can see I, I look a little bit younger there. You can probably still see I've got my little eye shadow still, and that's an old hockey injury. So yeah, I haven't got a baggy eye or anything like that. That's literally a, a hockey injury that happens. Uh, but yeah, really, really good to see that sort of stuff back in there. Um, and they must have been happy because they actually gave me one of these driving ambition books. Now, as far as I know, back then you couldn't purchase them without being part of the McLaren Owners Club. I think nowadays it's a different story. I think you can buy them. Um, I have seen them on eBay and Amazon and things like that. Um, but it was just really nice to sort of get a bit of a, a Brucey bonus regards to appreciation. I was just expecting to get paid for the work that we'd done um, and obviously shake hands and say, thank you very much for the privilege. And if you need anything else, give us a call. So it was really nice to receive this. 
Um, and I still have this, so and I've not read it yet. It's still in bubble wrap, so I don't know. It's not bubble wrap. It's still in its original wrapping, um, and I'll show you that in a second. So there we go, guys. That is the little story. Um, sorry, a bit rushed through, but it's still probably I don't know. This video is going to be probably about twenty five minutes long or so. Um, but yeah, that was the time that McLaren asked me to go and work on the F1. And here is the said book. And he also got one as well. And um, I think he opened his and had a read of it. And it's apparently quite good inside. So I'm going to keep this for prosperity, basically, just to say that, yeah, this I'll probably hand down to my kids or whatever I want to do sort of thing. Um, and basically a case of, yeah, this is when dad went to work and did some work for McLaren. So I hope you like that story, guys. Um, and obviously the whole point of this video is that I promise people on YouTube, when I reach a thousand subscribers, um, I'll tell you about the most special car I've ever worked on. And to me, that is the most special car I've ever worked on. It's definitely the most expensive. Um, it's not my most favorite car. It's definitely not my most favorite job. Um, the job itself, looking back, you can see the way we cut the tracks and everything else. It's, it's very basic, but it got the job done for what they needed. Now, there will be people, I know there'll be haters going like, oh, why did you do this and why did that? You do not understand how tough it was to work with McLaren in regards to trying to change anything in their car that wasn't theirs. Um, I think personally they hated someone external having to come in and deal with it, but I think it was maybe just beyond how they were thinking about how to get around the issues. Um, and obviously when you've got the owners of the car that are celebrities, like people like Rowan Atkinson, um, when they say, I want this, these companies will say, yep, no problem, we'll get it done. And then they've committed and now they have to find a way of doing it. Um, and it wasn't a very costly job for them, to be honest. I, I could have probably charged them 10 times the amount and they would have paid it by the looks of it. But it was a scenario where for me, it was just an honor to be able to go in at McLaren, work there and see some of the coolest cars that I've ever been. Definitely in that room where all those vehicles were, the most valuable cars like I think I'm ever gonna be around. So anyway, guys, I, I really hope you enjoyed this. And yet again, thank you so, so much for the 1000 subscribers. Um, I will continue to do what I'm doing. I hope you like it. There are some videos to come up, sort of ones that I've skipped in between. Um, there's a lovely camper van with all sort of a big sound system in it, everything to go. So there's some cool stuff. And obviously the benefit is, I don't know what's gonna be coming up next week. They could have a Fiat 500 that needs a, a full system in it, or we could have a McLaren F1 coming in. So you never know, guys. Anyway, thank you so much for your time for watching this. Thank you so, so much for all the support and the subscribers and everything else. Um, and I hope you had a good day, and I'll catch you on the next one.